for years I called this fly the Parmachine Bell. It's actually Parmachini Bell, named for the lake in Maine. Regardless, Henry P. Wells in the late 1800s designed a fly meant to imitate the fin on a brook trout. Throughout history, bait fishermen had caught a trout, cut the fin off, and used that fin as bait. Brook trout are fairly cannibalistic, as it turns out. And Wells' fly was amazingly successful and was used from the late 1800s all the way through the 70s. It was very popular in the Adirondacks, where I'm from. You couldn't go into a bait shop and not find a Parmachini Bell. As, as with all the other flies in this series, start the thread just behind the eye and take it all the way back to the bend. I've sped up some of the sequences in this video to cut down a little bit on the boredom. I like to tie my any any kind of tinsel or floss in on the far side of the hook. That way when you start wrapping it, it'll it'll appear to come out of the bottom of the fly. It's just a nice touch aesthetically. Five wraps back. And then five reps forward. I bind everything down underneath the hook and I back, notice I'm backing off the thread to get back to where the, I started originally. The idea there is to cut down some of the bulk at the rear of the body of the fly. If you don't do that, you can, you can wind up with a lot of bulk back there. I like to try to keep a level body by taking the thread all the way forward and all the way back when, after tying in just about anything. You'll see me spin the bobbin here periodically uh, counterclockwise, like unscrewing a light bulb. The idea there is to flatten the thread. The flatter your thread is, the um, smoother your underbody will be. For the purposes of this video, I'm not spending a lot of time on the underbody, but if I were doing this for publication or for, uh, or if this was a full dress salmon fly, I would straddle the hook with left and right tailing slips, each about in the neighborhood of, of six strands wide, certainly no, no wider than six strands. Take two loose wraps of thread around them and then pull them both up, straight up to the top of the hook. We want them to straddle just the top third of the shank on the hook. Bind everything down forward. Be sure to do um, considerable primping once you've got this tail mounted. I don't know how much time I spend doing this, way too much. Much better to just wait until the fly's done and then do this stuff, but not me. Cut off at an angle so that the uh, front of the fly will taper down. Do some more primping, whatever, whatever you do. It's a good idea to always hold the tail up as 
as you do almost anything on a fly. If you hold it up and in place, um, it's it's less prone to be a victim of thread torque, uh, etc. For the butt of this fly, I'm just going to use one strand of peacock curl, but you can do it any way you want. And I like to wind my hurl and, and set it up to wind so that the prominent stem on the underside, when I wind, goes forward. And I'm double checking it here just to make sure I've got it right. And I'll stroke the fibers back. The fibers actually will want to uh, tilt forward. So I'll stroke them back just so they stand up straight. And by, by winding the stem leading, you can uh, get a nice compact butt. And who doesn't want a nice compact butt? Bind the hurl down and cut it off. And again, go all the way forward and then flatten the thread. And start taking it back. I'm asked many times, how many turns of thread do you take before you flatten the thread and <laughs> to be honest as as much counting as I like to do when I tie a fly I've, I've never paid a whole lot of attention I just get a kind of a feel oh wait a minute the thread's twisting up a lot let me untwist it as you wrap the the thread will twist up Tie in flat gold tinsel for the rib on the far side and bind it down forward. Continue to work on the body, trying to get... These bodies need to be fat in the middle and tapered down at each end. Ideally. There are no hard and fast rules for any of this. It's mostly preferences and traditions. Tie in a single strand of four strand Danville floss at the front. Watch this. I'm going to stroke it. I got this from George Kelson. You stroke it and then you don't get any of that, any of those short fibers up at the beginning when you start to wind that are loose and cause problems. Always stroke your floss a little bit before you start. And then as you wind, as you wrap, let the floss slide through your fingers. Never wind floss with hackle pliers. The, the strands will break. Now this this can happen if you've got a if you've got a slope on your fly, which of course I do. What will happen is the um, the strands will separate. You'll get one or two strands that all of a sudden shoot off. In this case, to the right. Um, <clears throat> all you have to do is back off a turn or two, and then twist up the floss just a little bit. And that'll solve that problem. Trap the floss a couple times. Bind it down. Cut it. And wind back to where you want to tie off your ribbing.
wind the rib. In this case, because there's a butt on this fly, rather than doing my normal six turns, I'm only doing five. And it it will work out. But I've got less room, so it's it's harder to get six without it looking a little weird. But normally I'll do six, um, and the uh, sixth turn is, is obscured by the, the hackle. It's good practice to tie off on this, tie your ribbing off on the side. Underneath is all right, too, but the side works very well. I've got my two hackles stacked on each other, I'm tying them both in at the same time, and I'm going to wind them both at the same time. And I put the red on top because Henry P. Wells said that's what you should do. He wanted the red to be a little more prominent. Rather than folding the hackle ahead of time, I just stroke the fibers back as I wind. I always thought of this fly as a candy cane fly. It was, it was difficult to take this fly seriously. And for brown trout, you probably shouldn't. But for brook trout, it's great. Working on pulling this down into a beard. There's one stray here. Didn't even have to get out my tweezers for that one. It was pretty much ready to ready to go. The whole idea here is I, I don't want these hackles to, to be above the equator of the hook. I want to keep them low so they don't get in the way of the wing when I mount it. Because as I always say, the wing is the thing. Now I'm going to overwrap with black thread. I'm going to switch the thread out to black. This isn't complicated. Just overwrap a few times. And cut both butts. Now here comes the wing. I've married this up in advance. I'm not going to go into marrying in, in this video. I will soon have a separate video just talking about married wings. It's not hard. It's, marrying wings is incredibly easy. You only have to remember one rule. Lefts marry only to lefts, and rights marry only to rights. That's it. Now all your marrying will be successful. I'm using a lot of force binding this these butts down. 
the reason being, I don't have a lot of room at the head, and I really I want these things to stay put. It's it's necessary on these flies to glue these heads. There's no way around it. You just don't have enough enough room to 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 do a secure wing at the head. Now, to bind these butts down, you have to use a tremendous amount of force, almost to the breaking point of the thread. Truth be told, I screwed up the first whip finish I tried on this fly. I haven't done that in a, in a while. So this is the this is the second go. You can almost always save a fly. Just backtrack a little bit. Be sure, be sure to spend a lot of time primping this stuff. Here's, here's the, final, the final fly after considerable primping and fluffing and gluing. It's like a big candy cane. 